I know we're getting ready to start. Aloha kaku. Welcome all of you to this month's East West Center seminar. Each month, the East West Center Research Program presents the East West Center Research Speaker Series. Through this series, we explore the environmental, demographic, political, and economic processes that are reshaping the Asia Pacific region in profound ways. I'm Dr. Anna Sturr, Director of the Center for South Asian Studies and Associate Professor of Asian Studies here at the University of Hawaii at Banoa. And I'm delighted to be able to moderate this presentation by Dr. Amar Patnaik. I'm also excited to announce that through a partnership between the East West Center and the Center for South Asian Studies, we're including, including this webinar as part of a graduate seminar, South Asia Now. This seminar is part of a Master's in Asian International Affairs program through the Department of Asian Studies and open to students from our other Asian Studies Master's programs and across the university. The course aims to introduce students to recent South Asian history and current issues and develop an understanding of South Asia at the local and regional levels and as part of the contemporary global community. This is the first time that an East West Center webinar is part of a University of Hawaii course. So I want to thank Dr. Sumit Saxena and Dr. Sandeep Kandikupa, as well as all of the staff from the East West Center and from Dr. Patnaik's office for their help in setting this up. At the request of Dr. Potnaik, this webinar will be conducted in a more conversational format instead of the usual 40 minutes of individual presentation. So for housekeeping, we do still ask that you put your questions into the chat box and we will address them in the last 20 minutes or so of this webinar. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Amar Potnaik. Dr. Amar Potnaik is a member of parliament in India's Rajya Sabha from Odisha representing the Biju Janta Dal. Before becoming an MP, Dr. Patnaik had a large, long and illustrious career in the Indian Administrative Services and has served as a former Indian Audit and Account Services Officer under the Comptroller and Auditor General of India and as the Principal Accountant General of Sikkim, Odisha, West Bengal and Kerala. Dr. Patnaik has an MBA in Finance and Systems from Xavier's Institute of Management, Bhuvaneswar, and a master's program in public management from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Singapore, and the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. He is also an alumnus of a 2019 workshop on smart cities, co-organized by the East-West Center in Bengaluru. Dr. Patnaik has worked extensively on issues of power asymmetry in rural India, law, technology, with an emphasis on privacy and data protection, corporate and government affairs, and environmental and climate concerns. His state of Odisha has become a globally recognized leader among low and middle income countries as a model for natural disaster management. And it is this that had led him to write his latest book, Pandemic Disruptions and Odisha's Lessons in Governance, published in January, 2023. Dr. Patnaik's talk today will be drawn from the topics in his book and is entitled Odisha's Lessons in Governance, Case Studies of Natural Disasters and the Pandemic. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Potnaik. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Anna, uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, doc seminar. I think this is a master seminar or a doctoral seminar. I, I missed that point. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for, for getting me into this uh, uh, conversation. I'd love to be uh, answering the questions. Uh, you know, the 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 uh, pandemic disruptions and Odisha's lessons in governance uh, is something that the world has uh, uh, recognized already, uh, particularly with reference to natural disasters. Uh, Odisha's model in handling natural disasters had been uh, acknowledged by the UN uh, at several fora, and uh, it is it, it it is it is this particular learning from this uh, model that was transferred to the handling of the COVID. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, love to uh, uh, handle the questions. 
Thank you very much for being here. For my first question, we would love to hear more about Odisha's experience with respect to natural disasters over the years, perhaps beginning with the super cyclone in 1999. And perhaps um, this class has read some about um, Odisha's particular vulnerabilities to natural disasters. So perhaps you could also provide some of that background, background leading up to the devastating effects of the super cyclone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you see, Odessa is one of the coastal states of the country, uh, and it's on the eastern part of India. Uh, historically, uh, this state has al always faced natural disasters, uh, whether it is a super cyclone, or whether it is uh, massive floods because of uh, torrential rains. Uh, it, it has largely, however, been the super cyclones. Uh, estimates say that in a year, at least Orissa has faced two cyclones during the last 100 years on an average. Uh, so you can imagine that this is a disaster-prone uh, area, disaster-prone state. Now, what used to happen earlier uh, used to be the uh, emphasis on post-disaster uh, you know, relief measures, post-disaster, handling of uh, uh, the crisis. But in the year 2000, that is post the 1999 super cyclone, when in fact I was, uh, I, was, I was a civil servant at the time, I was working in my office on that day, despite uh, advice from my peers and friends not to go to office. I landed up in the office on the morning of, uh, uh, if I remember, it's the, it's the 29th or 30th of November, 1999. And I couldn't go back home because uh, the cyclone had hit and uh, there were trees all over. I was alone in that building, a student building, uh, looking at what was happening, the havoc that was being, uh, you know, uh, unleashed by the uh, super cyclone. But so the learning from that was that we cannot probably only uh, concentrate on post uh, disaster management, but we also have to. Uh, build up our capacity for pre-disaster management, pre-disaster preparedness. And that's when the entire, uh, you know, the narrative changed, the policy push uh, and the thrust changed. Uh, and, 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 and an emphasis was made on uh, building uh, community resilience. In fact, that's the uh, a key of the success of Orissa's handling of natural disasters, community uh, resilience, building community resilience. So not only were physical infrastructure built like cyclone, multi-purpose cyclone centers, um, uh, livelihood options during those periods, all these plans were put in place. But for the first time in the country, in India, uh, we set up the Odisha State Disaster Management Authority, recognizing the fact that we have to handle it uh, in a holistic manner, whole of government approach, and, and, and with an emphasis on preparedness rather than uh, only only waiting for the uh, for the disaster to go away and then concentrate on a post disaster recovery and and and, and uh, you know building up the livelihoods. Uh, so this disaster management authority, uh, in fact, in Odisha, uh, was the precursor to the national disaster management authority in India, uh, which happened in two thousand five. That's about five years after we had set it up. So the the one of the aspects of uh, uh, building this preparedness uh, was, of course, the infrastructural support which was set up at that time with World Bank assistance. Uh, but more importantly, as I said, it was the it was building community resilience. So the community, after getting an alert uh, about a cyclone, uh, you know, slowly gathered themselves up over a period of next five six years. That capacity was built to realize that they can't really weather the storm by staying in their own houses. And, you know, uh, Orissa was one of the poorest states at that time. And uh, therefore, there were those thatched houses. So uh, the houses would get swept away, uh, roofs would get uh, swept away, people would die. That's what happened in this 99 super cycle, about 10,000 people died. Uh, and, you know, after this model was followed, until now, 23 years, uh, um, our party has been in power in the state and our chief minister uh, Sri Naveen Patnaik has been in uh, has been in charge uh, the policy has been zero loss of lives so what 
uh, what was what as a part of the preparation for uh, the uh, for the cyclones, uh, we moved people away uh, physically. We 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 uh, make arrangements for people to shift to these cyclone multi-purpose cyclone shelters. Now these multi-purpose cyclone shelters are not just uh, buildings with roofs to weather the storm, but uh, they have uh, provisions for uh, uh, pregnant mothers, lactating mothers, for children, of, uh, and 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 the the way they have been designed, even the uh, the, the the animal livestock. Uh, which which is on which his livelihood depends. They are also brought in. Initially, this has been done in a coercive manner by the district administration, by the state, asking people, uh, lifting them to these shelters. But over this period of time, gradually one finds that they, the people themselves have taken charge and the government really doesn't have to do much. And that is why the success of the uh, Orissa model, uh, that, that the community itself takes charge. Uh, the government comes in in a supporting role to provide the infrastructure and of course after the cyclone to provide food grains to provide uh, uh, other kind of uh, you know relief measures to uh, for for the next 15 or 20 days to tide over the crisis that has already happened uh, so i think uh, this is the this is the model which uh, and you know building community resilience is not easy all of us know that uh, Community has to believe, has to trust uh, the government that whatever they are saying is correct, is good for them. And only then they would start moving in or they will start complying with what the government has told them to do. And this is what happened. Building the trust between the community and the state, community and the government, and believing that if we cooperate with the government, if we partner with the government, then it will be good for us. This was not there earlier pre pre-2000, pre-99 super, super cyclone. This is not there in many parts of the country as well, in many parts of the world as well. Coercive measures, regulatory measures uh, can only achieve so much and not, and not, not more than that. Uh, what, is, what can be achieved is, uh, is, is through only community. And this is what Orissa has shown. And therefore, it has become a leader now to the, uh, not only in the country, but even outside. Whenever there is a natural disaster, uh, the the uh, Orissa uh, is Orissa is consulted. Orissa government is consulted. Of course, as a part of the infrastructure build up, capacity development, we have the disaster recovery forces. We have the uh, equipment to you know to remove trees, cut trees. We have the satellite phones. All those were not there before ninety nine. But building that capacity, I thought, was easy. More difficult was building community resilience, and that is what has happened. Uh, in the uh, in the Orissa's handling of the natural disaster management. I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit more about how exactly you went about building community resilience. Yes. So what what we did uh, is that initially, initially in small villages, uh, there were uh, there were awareness uh, camps which were organized. The youth clubs were involved. Uh, small uh, pamphlets. Uh, about what a disaster, how a disaster can be handled, uh, how you can, one can prepare for the disaster. One can't prevent a natural disaster, but one could probably prepare for it. And uh, then only comes the uh, question of, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, getting the relief and other, other stuff. So this preparedness aspect was built gradually uh, through many, many ways. One was, of course, as I said, the youth clubs, Another one is uh, pamphlets. Another one was very important was doing mock drills from time to time. And imagine uh, in a country of 1.4 billion, uh, let's say in even in Orissa, uh, the population is uh, about 45 million. And uh, in that particular belt, Eastern Coast, which faces these natural disasters time to time, uh, it will be about one third of that. So at several points of time, about uh, 12 to 15 uh, uh, you know, 12 to 1,500,000 people uh, have been, we call them as lakh, 12 lakh, 15 lakh people have been, 1.5, 1.2 million people have been uh, physically evacuated before uh, an impending uh, disaster. This cannot happen unless the people believe uh, in this uh, mechanism. And that trust has been built uh, 
you know, initially there is always a uh, always a kind of uh, uh, you know doubt. There is always a uh, you know diffidence that whether this is the right way. But when it worked first time uh, and worked for bigger cyclones, fiery, funny, many cyclones in over a period of the last twenty three years, people started believing that what the government has been saying is correct. So we currently do mock drills at least twice in a year. We do the pamphlet distribution, social media, use of social media now uh, aggressively uh, to communicate to people about uh, the cyclones. The early warning system earlier is to be conveyed probably through radio. Now we are using all mechanisms that is including social media, television, uh, and also physically uh, the various groups. And lastly, I think the important thing is Previously, during the period of the cyclone, people did not have food to eat, people did not know or uh, didn't get drinking water. Now, all these have been provided for in the multi-purpose uh, cyclone shelters. Uh, so people realize that during that period, if they can go into this uh, shelters, they get even all those uh, facilities. They don't they, they don't really miss anything that uh, during that period, which they used to have, which used to happen earlier. Earlier, the relief used to reach only after 15, 20 days. Uh, now, th there is no no, no uh, uh, kind of shortage of uh, food to eat and uh, water to drink and uh, medical facilities. Doctors are standby. Uh, livestock doctors are also there. So the livelihood option is also taken care of. Uh, and the only thing that remains after the cyclone is, is uh, you know, rebuilding their life, rebuilding their livelihood options, rebuilding their homes in many cases, and re rebuilding the, uh, uh, the the community infrastructure. Uh, for example, the power cables, the power lines, the electricity poles, which uh, which get uprooted during the time. Uh, all these are done post uh, cyclone. As a step, further step forward, uh, the community resilience has been built uh, around the uh, concept of. Uh, women self-help groups. So these women self-help groups uh, uh, have been organized in uh, most of these communities. Morissa is once again a leader in the country in how women force uh, can be marshaled to not only negotiate natural disasters, we, we, we use them for food distribution during COVID to those people who, could, who were destitutes at their homes. Uh, this could not have been possible without uh, these women circle groups. These women circle groups come from the same community. So they have more responsibility. They are more empowered. And then they take charge uh, during these uh, situations. So there are mul multiple ways in which community resilience is built. It was obviously not uh, in a year or in a, a couple of years or over three years. Over this period of times, I think uh, by the time 2010, 12, we had mastered this particular thing. Uh, and and uh, henceforth, it is it has been uh, it, it has been actually a cakewalk uh, to handle these uh, natural disasters without uh, loss of lives, without disrupting livelihood greatly, and uh, most uh, importantly, uh, without breaking the confidence of these communities uh, that their life uh, is will change forever. They realize that their life will not change forever. Thank you. And I'm also wondering um, about how the lessons that you all learned from this highly successful community resilience building and disaster preparedness project over all of these years were able to be applied to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is something that you also talk about in your book. So That's right. I, That's right. Oh, That's right. Don't such a diverse place with um, the various tribal populations and then also your um, urban populations, populations working in agriculture and industry. So could you speak about the lessons that you learned and then also how you were able to apply them to that great diversity of groups of people? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, in fact, uh, all of us should remember that when the COVID struck uh, in the first wave, no one in the world knew how to handle it because uh, a, a, a pandemic of that proportions was faced by the world about 100 years ago in the Spanish flu in the 1900s, so early 1900s. So uh, this was a, this is the kind of uh, situation which confronted the uh, entire country and the entire world. 
Orissa realized that it can't really learn anything from others because this is a new thing. So the only thing they could uh, you know, fall back on was the learning from the natural disaster, management of natural disasters. But the natural disaster handling uh, was a different uh, cup of tea because you could move people, evacuate people, and keep them uh, for three, four days. But in the pandemic of uh, 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 global proportions and... Uh, which was a kind of a different uh, pandemic. It's a health pandemic. It was an infectious disease, so you can't. It was actually the reverse. You can't get people together, but you have to keep them separately. And uh, so, so uh, how to apply there? So I think the first thing uh, they did, and this is again where uh, Orissa, I think, did it right, was the fact they realized that this cannot be achieved. The lockdown can achieve some some things. Lo lockdown can achieve. Uh, you know, uh, physical, uh, social distancing, uh, that's all, that's about it. Uh, but the people have to be fed. Those who could not actually, children have to be fed. Uh, those who could not go to, uh, you know, to the food centers, the very poor, they also have to be delivered food, cooked food at their doorsteps, otherwise they will die. And not out of pandemic, but out of hunger. So hunger was one issue, food security was an issue which had to be addressed. Uh, of course, livelihood security was also there in a limited way. Uh, at that time, everything, everyone was thinking about saving their lives. And if you remember during the first wave, uh, the emphasis was on cleaning, uh, washing, cleaning your hands, washing your hands with uh, soap or sanitizer, uh, then putting their mask on. Now we realize that, and when there is a lockdown, the adequate number of masks for a population of 1.4 uh, billion people would not be manufactured. Nobody had thought that this pandemic would come. It is it in just a couple of weeks. So even Orissa found it difficult to, uh, you know, locate who were the manufacturers of these uh, pandemics. So then we again fell back on our uh, time-tested uh, uh, natural disaster handling model and relied on started relying on the community. So there are different sections of community. First, for in, 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 the, in the initial period, we again went back to our women's self-help groups. The women's self-help groups knew exactly which house, which person in each of the household was suffering from what pre-existing ailment, where there was a food problem, where there was not a food problem. So we gave them the uh, charge of distribution of uh, food grains and cooked food to those people who couldn't even go to a kitchen, community kitchen. Uh, and they did remarkably well. Uh, that was the food security aspect. The health aspect, that is wearing masks. So how to do? Again, these women's self-help groups, through their own effort, made a record stitching of this cloth made. If you remember at that time, cloth made uh, uh, you know, uh, masks were sufficient, were told to be sufficient. So they stitched and distributed to each of the households. And then the question was uh, how to communicate to people these, uh, you know, preventive measures of washing hands and all that. Uh, so that was, you know, you won't believe this, but in Orissa, much faster than the government's own machinery of communicating this was done by these women's self-help groups and by community radio stations. So community radio stations are much more in sync with the community, uh, much smaller, but they contribute significantly. One person could actually play the music and uh, the jingle and it would go down to everyone. Uh, and they could actually hear it in their houses. The community radio stations also had the biggest, big advantage that they could converse with them in their local language. Because as you know, as you said, uh, in the, not only India, Orissa itself is very diverse. 62 different tribes are there. There are tribal pockets. The languages in western part and eastern part of Orissa are different. Uh, so that had to be communicated. So you can see uh, largely it, it is the community that was delivery. So when we saw that, in another 15-20 days, there was a question of quarantine. There was a question of uh, isolated, isolation wards, isolating people. How to do that? Isolation centers at every village level cannot be constructed by government in such a short time. So again, we fell back on the uh, community, what we call as the local self-governments. Uh, we have that in other countries as well. So we call them the panchayats. Uh, we empowered 
we empowered for the first time in the country the panchayat head with administrative powers of what we call as the district collector. The district head is a part of our administrative system, uh, who is a part of our civil services, part of the executive with full powers to enforce laws. So that power was delegated to the Sarpanch, who was not a, not a very educated person, not a part of the uh, civil service, but a representative of the community. And when we do, did that, it, 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 it did wonders. You won't believe in villages in Orissa, uh, they themselves set up uh, barricades out the outskirts of the village and ensured that there was a small hut created outside, constructed outside that barricade. So anybody who came from outside, even of their own community from a city, had to stay in that particular hut for 15 days and then were allowed entry into the village. Now, this was acting as an isolation ward. This was acting as a quarantine center. Schools were converted into quarantines, were handed over to the community to manage. The government only provided the infrastructure. So delegation, decentralization to the community and communitization of the entire effort completely saw us uh, through. And let me tell you, Orissa is a poor state. Orissa's uh, primary health centers, that is the at the very primary level, is not as developed as the rest of the country or let's say even Kerala. But it is this community effort uh, which succeeded. And this was the right move because at the time, no vaccines were there. There were no vaccines. Nobody knew what was happening. So the only thing they knew was that you have to uh, quarantine, you have to isolate, keep them for a few days, uh, do the proning, do yoga, do whatever. And this could be best done only through community. And that is what was done. Thank you so much. Now, um. It seems like this model of delegation, decentralization, and communitization of how everything is implemented has been extremely successful in Odisha. I'm wondering about how other states in India have maybe tried to implement this model and what have been some of the barriers and challenges and what have been some of their successes in implementing it in their different locations. So, so uh, you see, uh, I think uh, large parts of India uh, are uh, are in a similar situation as Orissa, uh, with the with with the diversity in the population, uh, except for the uh, big cities. Incidentally, it is in, in the the maximum amount of death uh, uh, because of the second wave uh, happened in the cities, not in the villages of India. And that was uh, because in the cities, as usual, social capital is less, communities, the people don't talk to each other. So the maximum amount of casualty were in Delhi, Bangalore, and all this, and not in the rural areas. So the first waves uh, experience really helped uh, uh, the, uh, the community to realize uh, that uh, they have to take charge. And the state government also realized that they have to uh, give this power to the community, empower them. Uh, this was followed very successfully even in Kerala, where Kerala, there is already a very strong community community uh, mobilization and community resilience model existing for a long period of time. Community-based governance uh, has been the hallmark of Kerala, which the entire country had been talking about. But Kerala never faced these kind of disasters the way Orissa was facing. The only thing was that the community uh, was empowered. So even though the... Uh, the rate of positivity was very high in Kerala. The fatality rate was very low because, uh, again, because the community taking charge of isolation, quarantine, administration of the you know basic knowledge about uh, uh, hand washing and uh, putting masks on and all kind of uh, while going on. Uh, so, and the same thing was also followed in uh, several uh, other states. Uh, and you see, for a community. There was no other way because there's no access to uh, in modern healthcare services of a very, uh, they had access, but not of that level in which uh, uh, 500 patients can go to a particular uh, primary level health center in a, in a, in a, in a subdivision uh, or a group of villages and get uh, beds for them. It was, it was not there. And therefore, uh, the other states also started uh, following this model. Uh, states like I know West Bengal started following this, Madhya Pradesh started following this, and quite successfully, I thought. Uh, and as I said, uh, 
when the cities started wor working, uh, the, the cities the cities handled it in setting up big, uh, very big isolation centers, isolation wards. In Mumbai, for example, the slum, Dharavi, which is the world's largest slum, uh, with uh, uh, about, I think, uh, uh, 2 million people staying in that slum. Uh, the incident of uh, fatality was very low. And they were staying in, the density of population is very high in that area. And that is because they adopted this model that the key to uh, handling this was uh, isolation uh, and quarantine. Uh, so this was followed by them. And of course, the second wave had this question of oxygen supply. And if you do Google, you'll find, I have written about it in my book as well, Orissa supplied oxygen to 19 states in the country. Uh, and despite, and at the time when the supply of oxygen was going through cryogenic cylinders, which were even not available at that time, some of it had to be brought in from Singapore and somebody, some had to be brought in from uh, Dubai and many such places. There was a cyclone on fun hitting Orissa as well. Despite the cyclone, these vehicles moved in, uh, in, in corridors, in, in uh, you know, dedicated corridors. And this uh, by by road by trucks and this oxygen sub was supplied to 19 states and therefore 19 out of 30 states and therefore the several lives could be saved. Uh, so Orissa not only uh, looked after itself uh, but it looked after the others as well. Uh, and I think this is this this is the kind of governance where uh, social capital element comes in, even though it is not built into our governance models, uh, uh, has held this country of 1.4 billion uh, to weather this uh, crisis in the best possible manner, probably in the entire world. Thank you. Um, another question that I have now, we've talked about how other states in India have been um, adopting aspects of this model. How about other countries within South Asia, other nearby countries, or even um, elsewhere in the world? Are you aware of other countries who have tried to adopt aspects of this community-led approach? And do you know how successful or how challenged they have been? Yes. Uh, in fact, the first uh, uh, nation that comes to my mind is a uh, small Pacific Island country, uh, Fiji. I remember uh, our people going to Fiji and Fiji's uh, people coming to Orissa to be trained on natural disaster management. Uh, people, people uh, the, the, the uh, persons, uh, the uh, people who are involved in disaster management in the states in India, they have been coming regularly to Orissa for training. And whenever there is a disaster anywhere in India, whether it was in Gujarat, the earthquake, it is Kerala, the floods in Kerala, or the tsunami, everywhere, uh, our people, Orissa's, uh, Orissa's uh, disaster response force, and the Orissa's model of uh, uh, handling the disaster uh, has been has been has come in handy for those states. They have uh, they reached out to us, but. The, uh, uh, as far as countries are concerned, for example, the uh, uh, I talked about Fiji. I I know of Nepal, which has uh, reached out to us. Nepal faced an earthquake. Now I'm sure uh, they would have uh, followed the uh, model that we had. Uh, uh, they had we we had imparted some training to those people who had come and visited us and stayed with us. I know of uh, uh, countries uh, uh, in the in the in the in the Indo-Pacific. Who have also come and uh, got trained. Our people go regularly uh, to to train people outside uh, Turkey. They had gone. I remember uh, many many such countries because the UN, the United Nations, uh, United Nations has um, literally marvelled at the way this has been done in Orissa over a period of. This is this hasn't been overnight done overnight or in a couple of years or three four years. This has taken time. This is taken about 15, 20 years to stabilize. So building community resonance uh, uh, in those communities in other countries will definitely take time. Uh, Orissa's people go and handle the disaster at that point of time. But for the community to develop that resilience, they have to trust their government. That is the number one thing. The government has to trust the community, empower the community, and decentralize, delegate power to them. 
and they also have to uh, you know not just say that you are empowered but empower them by both physical uh, providing them the physical gadgets and equipment required the the uh, you know uh, the the the, the uh, behavioral change that is required uh, to believe in themselves that has to be instilled in them community champions or community leaders have to be built in each of those communities now all this happened over a longer period of time in uh, orissa so i i think those states which are handling uh, countries which are uh, which are facing this kind of disasters particularly uh, you know cyclones and uh, the blizzards and uh, ty uh, typhoons i think uh, they will have to do that i am sure i am sure that sociologists and anthropologists realize that building this community resilience which in a way contributes to social capital as well is the key but building it is not easy most places the community or the people the citizen do not believe their governments they believe that the government is in many of these countries they believe that the government uh, will not think about them the government is probably manned by officials who are not sensitive to the needs uh they they have seen corruption they have seen uh indifference so you know and in, in, even now in such in many parts of india this kind of feeling is there about governments whichever government is there but as far as natural disaster is concerned in orissa uh they started trusting the government and they and therefore they started developing the uh, 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 capacity and when government told them that you should do this to build your capacity they believed it and they they trained themselves they uh, read those pamphlets they did those mock drills in every village in every panchayat a mock drill is done uh, this has taken time uh, but this is the only way forward for uh, for 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 a country of 1.4 uh, billion of a large uh, population countries with large uh, population on the on the coast Uh, or on the uh, facing uh, on the on the uh, ocean rings or uh, in the middle of uh, oceans uh, and uh, even in morisus we train people morisus people came and got trained in orissa so many countries are starting to learn from this uh, uh, model and this experience thank you so much I think there's definitely a lot that um, many of us can learn from it. I want to turn um this is going to be my own last personal question and then we'll turn to questions from um other participants in the webinar. Um it's clearly a, an admirable model for natural disaster approaches and Odisha has recently um befallen or a man-made disaster has recently befallen odisha in the um the train derailment which happened several months back so i'm wondering if any of the lessons which you learned from the natural disaster management protocols that you've put into place over so many years could be brought to bear on addressing this um man-made terrible tragedy right uh in fact uh <clears throat> when this tragedy struck uh, around 7 pm in the evening darkness everywhere and it was not nearer to one of the big cities so access was an issue people reaching that place there were there, there was no electricity no lights so even before even before the government uh, people the railway officials they reached there with uh, cutters and steel cutters For, extric uh, for for extricating uh, people and bodies from there, and you know cranes and all those things. The, again, the community had uh, had uh, reached the spot, and the community had started pulling people through the windows by cutting by by pulling them out using handmade uh, uh, you know uh, iron rods, and uh, you know in in their own way, and they saved many lives. But most important, which even we never thought. As a, as a part of the government, a member of parliament, uh, not from that area, but from my state, uh, and since we had seen natural disasters, what we saw that there was a queue of people in the small hospitals all over that uh, uh, in that area, lining up, queuing up uh, there to donate blood. We had never appealed to them. 
We had never told them that blood is required. But they came on that day and I think record 500 units of blood was donated on that day itself for the patients. And mind you, this was a train in which the people from our own state, I think only 39 lost their lives out of uh, uh, 290. So they were not even from our uh, 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 state. But it is human values. Uh, our CM, our chief minister, says that every life is important uh, and no loss of life of anyone. That's why we supplied oxygen to the rest of the state. I think that particular ethos had gone into a behavioral change in our uh, citizens and communities. So even though no one asked them, they went there, donated blood. This blood saved several lives. They helped them to carry in stretchers in 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 uh, in, in, in a temporary uh, makeshift stretchers to hospitals, even because there, there couldn't be so many ambulances rushed to that place at the same time. They gave them food. They gave them water. They 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 helped the uh, civil authorities, civic authorities to uh, you know uh, transport the bodies in a in a dignified manner to the hospital. They helped the uh, uh, sit, the the relatives of citizens. Uh, to identify uh, their 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 their, uh, their their relatives who are dead or those who were injured, uh, and this happened. You imagine this happened uh, without any commotion, without any uh, you know uh, law and order problem, uh, without uh, people taking law into their hands, which probably sometimes uh, used to be what was happening earlier. But now I see this change, and they were all youth, young people who, who they knew who had to give blood. In fact, it was most, uh, you know, inspirational to see some 60, 70 year old uh, men standing in queue to donate blood, uh, and uh, you know, giving water at that point of time is what is required. So they gave water and they gave food. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the the government of the day or no government of the day at any point of time anywhere in the world could have asked for more from the community. Uh, the way they rose up to the occasion. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to move to the questions which people have put in the question box now. And our very first question is from uh, Sumit Saxena. This is, he asks, are there any tensions and weaknesses in center-state relations that need to be fixed to improve disaster management? Well, what... Uh, currently, currently, uh, India has a National Disaster Management Authority and a National Disaster Management Act. Uh, so this uh, disaster management uh, is a is 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 a responsibility which is to be shared both by the center and the states. The center, uh, in fact, realized it pretty pretty uh, early on that ultimately at the uh, ground level, the people uh, or the authorities who are going to face this disaster are the state government officials. So their effort has to be uh, supplemented and not follow an independent path. So there is a national uh, crisis uh, management group uh, led, uh, led by the cabinet secretary under the National Disaster Management uh, Authority or I think under the DM Act. Uh, so what they do, the center does, is rush in the army if it is required, on, if it is called for, called for by the uh, state. They rush in helicopters, they rush in uh, uh, paramilitary forces if they have to supplement the efforts of the disaster uh, response force. And they also have a national disaster response force which, who also move in over there. So, so far what I have seen in Oressa and I think in the rest of the country, that the uh, handling of a disaster has largely been uh, a collaborative effort uh, between center and state, which is a very good thing. The only thing is uh, which I have a quarrel with, in which I would advise the center to do, is to devolve more resources to the states to build uh, anti-disaster or let's say to build preventive measures uh, and disaster resilient infrastructure. Now, I would give you an example. We decided after the huge super cyclone funny that hit uh, in uh, 2019 May in uh, again Orissa, uh, the capital of Orissa, Bhubaneswar and Puri, uh, we realized that the maximum damage uh, 
uh, was caused from the uh, uprooting of the electric poles and therefore disruption of electricity, resulting in disruption of water supply because the generators would not work nothing. So a proposal was given that let us lay cables below the ground in, in these coastal areas instead of uh, keeping it above the surface. Uh, that would require a huge amount of money. Now, no state can afford it from its own resources because states have limited uh, uh, sources for raising, this, raising their revenues. So this is a proposal which was made to the government of India, but uh, the resources haven't yet come. Uh, similarly, for a tsunami kind of a situation, you need to have those anti-sea uh, uh, surge uh, embankments. Now, that has also uh, not happened. I think the government of India uh, should devolve more resources uh, to the states to develop this uh, disaster resilient infrastructure, disaster resilient agriculture, disaster resilient uh, uh, electric power supply connections. All this should be a part of a bigger plan, a national uh, strategy. And money should be devolved to the states to take care of local variations and develop this. Uh, because ultimately, even though we save human lives, we save livestock and, and save their livelihood after the disaster, a huge amount of expenditure goes in, 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 in rebuilding the infrastructure. Uh, so if we, however, in, in, you know, uh, invest in it uh, upfront as a part of preparedness measure, I think that money could be saved instead of spending it every year after year after year. And that is where I think the center should allocate more resources. Fortunately, in the Finance Commission, we have the mechanism of a Finance Commission which decides on the devolution of resources between the center and the states. Disaster management and disaster uh, management as a or disaster response has been acknowledged uh, as a key element uh, to be taken into account while devolving resources. So a mechanism is in place. Resources are also flowing, but not adequately. And secondly, these resources are coming from the center largely to, 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 to mitigate the, uh, you know, as, as a post-disaster relief and to mitigate the post-disaster conditions. What our chief minister has been saying, and which I completely agree with, I think most of the other states will also uh, you know, agree with this uh, suggestion that we need to start now investing uh, in, in developing pre-disaster uh, infrastructure, disaster resilient infrastructure in various areas, so that the for expenditure that we incur after the disaster would gradually uh, reduce instead of being incurring it from year to year every year. Thank you so much for that thorough explanation. Um, we now have a long question, which actually goes back to the topic of post-disaster relief. So this question is from Biplav Podal, who is a member of the seminar, and he is a PhD student in economics coming from Nepal. So Biplav asks, in the aftermath of major natural disasters, we witness a global outpouring of aid encompassing essentials ranging from money to things as diverse as food, clothing, tarps, medicines, etc. In Odisha, when faced with similar calamities, could you elaborate on the strategies and mechanisms the state employs to centralize, manage, and distribute these diverse forms of assistance equitably? How does the state ensure that these diverse forms of contributions from individuals, clubs, private entities, NGOs, INGOs, local foundations, and the international community are utilized in the most effective way to benefit the effect benefit the affected populations. And then he gives the example of what has been happening in the aftermath of the recent earthquake in Western Nepal. But I'll stop the question there to give you more time to respond. Well, this is really a challenge. And this is what we realized, uh, what is I realized, I was there at the time, a part of the government, uh, post super cycle of 99. Uh, there was out, there was outpouring of uh, grief and uh, pouring in of uh, uh, various kind of aid, both in kind and uh, equipment from various parts of the world. Um, so 
that year itself, uh, we realized it was a Herculean task to manage this itself. It, it shouldn't happen that communities uh, who are not affected should be getting this. Communities who are affected should not be getting it twice over or thrice over, while other communities are not getting it. The right individuals in, in a natural disaster or even a man-made disaster, in a disaster of any kind, at a climate-related disaster, it is the poorest who suffer the most. This is already proven. And the disadvantaged who suffer the most. The women suffer the most, the children suffer the most. So in a war also, the same thing. So to identify them and ensure that the uh, help reaches them, a mechanism has to be in place. Now, government, again, can do uh, so much, but only when a community is uh, built around this uh, thought that uh, you know they have to look after their community members uh, and equitably because uh, they have to look after the poor first and then those who can afford. Now, this was not there in 99. I, I, I admit because I've seen it myself. But subsequently, when the National Disaster Management Authority uh, in the state, it was the Orissa State Disaster Management Authority which was set up. It has, it has personal, it has computerized applications developed where we now do not allow everyone to approach the community from different sources, go straight there and deliver. What is now being done is that anybody could actually uh, show their intent uh, through an email or uh, by uh, other means of coming, even by WhatsApp message, to a single point of contact in the disaster management authority. And then we have the data of how many communities, how many villages uh, have been affected. Who is the person who will be taking charge in distribution of relief at that point? And who will ensure that it is distributed equitably by various village groups uh, which have been formed? So it's essentially now monitored. But at this point of time, I do not know, you can Google and he can Google and find this out. When a disaster struck uh, in, 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 in Orissa recently, the central government, the prime minister came and offered about a thousand crores uh, to Orissa. But our chief minister said, no, we don't need it. We will be able to handle it with our own resources. And that money could actually be given to those communities or those people who actually are have suffered much more than us. Now, this is the kind of humanitarian uh, statesman-like approach that political leaders have to follow, governments have to follow. And this would actually be an example for community leaders also to show uh, uh, statemanship, uh, which which is what is uh, what was not happening earlier. But the official mechanism is now a single point, and then the single point tells these are the distribution, these are the areas where you need. So there are the district of collectors. So the uh, at the state level, the uh, disaster management authority uh, gets all the uh, you know uh, helps uh, aids and intention of uh, help, different kinds. It, it could be blankets, it could be food items, it could be torches, it could be uh, biscuits, many different things. Then they decide which are the areas which are uh, more hit than the others. Within that particular geographical area, which are the panchayats or the villages which are hit more. So this data is, this work is done centrally. And then the uh, authorities or the philanthropists who want to uh, you know, contribute, are given the address of that particular district collector or that particular block development officer to go to and provide that relief. So by this method, largely, uh, we have been able to make this more equitous. Uh, all the time, uh, uh, you know, uh, being sensitive to the needs of women and children during this crisis and people who cannot probably speak and people who are uh, let's say, uh, fortunately, in this particular area, we do not have large tracts of tribal people. But if they were, then they had to be dealt with differently because uh, they haven't really, um, uh, you know, had access to many of the better facilities. So those people who already have uh, access to better facilities by being nearer to city centers, nearer to state capital, uh, cannot be cornering all these uh, aid and assistance. 
So we 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 take care of this through this authority of the disaster management authority. Thanks so much. We have several more questions. So I'm going to uh, go with a question from Sandeep Kandikupa. And if you keep your answer um, a bit concise, then we can maybe get to a few of the others as well. So this question, he writes, thank you for your excellent talk. What kind of preparedness do you anticipate is required as you face up to the likelihood of multiple disasters as a re result of climate change? including phenomena like heat waves, cyclones, and untimely and torrential rainfall? This is a difficult question because, uh, you know, it's not really multiple challenge, multiple disaster we have faced before. For example, uh, I, 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 I can't exactly recollect the time when we faced a uh, uh, first day super cyclone, and at the same time, uh, there, was, uh, uh, there, was, there were floods. Uh, because of torrential rain. So this has happened, this we face. But climate change is a different, uh, you know, beast altogether. Because a disaster can come and go. The cyclone barely stays for a day or two days and goes back. Of course, all this damage, destruction, then we start rebuilding. The flood water recedes. But the kind of climate change, a portion of, let us say, Bangladesh goes down, a portion of India goes down uh, on the coast, the city goes down. That is irreversible. Many of the changes as an after impact of climate change will be irreversible. So to face them, the preparedness is to, uh, on it is much more uh, longer duration and it has to, uh, of course, community will play a big role, but not. We have one final question from Ashima Kal, and I'm going to shorten it a bit. She is from Jammu and Kashmir, and she would like to know if the JNK government approached Odisha for assistance in responding to the pandemic there, and also what specific ways can we approach disaster situations in conflict zones? Hey, Anna, I, we've lost Dr. Pamak. Uh, if Hold on okay. just a second. Okay. Well, um, in that case, since we are unfortunately at the end of the webinar, I will give my closing remarks. And then if he does come back on, perhaps we can give him the chance to answer a few more questions. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Podnik very much for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you very much for attending to all of these varied questions and giving us so much of your time and your insight. Um, thank you also to everyone in the audience for being a fantastic audience. And I apologize for not being able to get to all of your many wonderful questions. I would like you all to know that the recording of this webinar will be posted on the East West Center's YouTube channel, as well as on the East West Center website's event page shortly. And while it's traditional to provide information about the next webinar, actually, we don't have an up and coming webinar in the next month. So um, please do check the East West Center website for information about when the next webinar will be. Thank you all very, very much and have a good evening or a good day wherever you are.